They called it a conspiracy theory. The media ignored it. The scientific establishment dismissed it. The tech giant censored it. But today, they're largely embracing it. The lab leak hypothesis when it comes to the origins of the pandemic, the idea that SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, originated at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, is now mainstream. So what do we know about this lab and why was there such a concerted effort by elite institutions around the world to keep the public in the dark? We'll explore those questions tonight in this special edition of Hold the Line. Welcome to this special edition of Hold the Line. I'm Buck Sexton. It was a crazy idea in the beginning, right? You couldn't really think that a Chinese uh, lab that was doing research would be involved in the early stage of a massive pandemic that swept the world, infected hundreds of millions, killed a few million. The scientific community would never help them cover that up, right? Well, as it turns out, there does seem to be something along the lines of a, you know, they, they refer to the blue wall of silence when it comes to cops. Looks like there's a scientific community wall of silence too, at least when it came to getting to the origins of this. They backed each other up. There were some who were involved in getting grants for the Wuhan Institute of Virology. There were some who knew all about gain of function research occurring, and they decided that it was much more useful, shall we say, to focus on the now very unlikely possibility that this COVID-19 pandemic started because a bat had a virus that then jumped to an intermediary species that then jumped to human beings. We never found that intermediary species. And in other cases of zoonotic transmission, they actually do find what that species is. They have found it in the past. The animals in the uh, the market did not seem to actually have this virus. So why would we have been told that from the beginning? Why was there a false consensus peddled by some members of the international scientific community? Did they think they were doing the world a favor by pretending that China is just like any other country and no need to worry about gain of function research going on in a lab that's not only found, uh, funded by and run according to the dictates of the Chinese Communist Party, but also has direct connection to the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Shouldn't that be something that we all know and are willing to at least talk about? Shouldn't we explore all the possible angles? Isn't the most important thing that we make sure there's not another pandemic like this one? And to achieve that, don't we have to know how this one started? And then there were the lies told by China about the early days of this virus. There are even allegations as of this week, that they have erased a lot of the data from those early days. But from the very beginning, we knew that China wasn't telling the truth about this. We knew that the position of the Chinese Communist Party was going to be to take whatever data there was out there that supported their version of events and actually put the data out there themselves uh, and then make sure that people couldn't actually get down to really what happened here. They didn't want people to know. They didn't want them to have a real understanding of it. Because can you imagine what the fallout would be if, in fact, the Chinese Communist Party's directed research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology resulted in essentially a lost year for all of humanity, a year of lockdowns and misery and death and sickness because China can't be trusted, because the Chinese Communist Party decided it was more important to keep their grip on power, then work constructively with the world to address this right away. And then, of course, there's the media cover-up. In their haste to go against Donald Trump, they were willing to say whatever, including parrot the talking points of the CCP, to pretend that there was a scientific consensus when that never should have been part of this storyline, because there wasn't. It was too early. They didn't know. And in fact, they were suppressing the likelier scenario. They said it was the wet market theory instead of the lab leak theory. Well, we're going to dive into all of this on this special edition of Hold the Line. We've got a whole bunch of great guests lined up for you tonight to shed light on the lab leak theory. 
After the break, we'll talk to Dr. Stephen Quay about the dangerous research being conducted at the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the evidence that COVID-19 was in fact the product of human hands, human intervention. Stay right there. I've been telling you for a while now about online thieves who can easily steal your home's title. But you don't have to take my word for it. Take it from this thief who stole over 150 homes and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. This is why you need Home Title Lock. Nobody thinks that I can take their house and borrow against the house. Oh, no, I have title insurance for that. No, it's, it's in my name. Or he would have to get some special document. They would call me. You know, nobody's calling you. After I've stolen the title, borrowed against it, or sold the property, or done whatever I've done with it, it's 60 to 90 days to even figure out that, that they're the victim of this crime. You know, by that point, you start getting foreclosure notices, and you realize you've got four mortgages on your house. Not only that, you don't even own your home anymore. It's not even in your name. Heard enough? Don't let this crime happen to you. Go to HomeTitleLock.com and register your address to see if you're already a victim and enter radio for 30 free days of protection. That's code radio at HomeTitleLock.com. Again, code radio at HomeTitleLock.com. Welcome back. The potential danger posed by gain of function research, which is the science at the center of the Wuhan lab controversy, has been well understood by the scientific community and our government for quite some time. In 2014, the National Institutes of Health actually placed a moratorium on funding the research, a ban that was reversed in December of 2017. So just what is gain of function research and why is it so dangerous? Here to help us understand some of the science is the CEO of Atosa Therapeutics, Dr. Stephen Quay. Doctor, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate it. It's great to be here. So, all right, Dr. Quay, explain this. Let's start with the kind of research that was being done at the Wuhan Institu Institute, gain of function research. Can you explain what does this entail? Sure. Well, it's, it's, can sound kind of scary because it probably is. You take a virus that is already reasonably uh, infective or reasonably dangerous, and you add things to it to try to make it even more dangerous with the concept that you could then perhaps get ahead of it if it ever came from nature. So, so essentially you, you make the virus worse to prepare for an actual worse virus that would occur at some undetermined point in the future but I'm just wondering, when they do this kind of research, can they have any sense of, I mean, you know, could they make it a lot worse, you know, I mean, without even really intending to hypercharge the virus? I mean, are they, is it always incremental is effectively what I'm trying to ask, or is it like a mutation? They don't necessarily know what they're doing. That, that's a great way to look at it. And, and nature is very incremental. It does things in a relatively slow fashion. With gain-of-function research, I can do about a thousand years of evolution in one afternoon. Wow. In 2016, you know, Peter Daszak, whose organization, the EcoHealth Alliance, uh, helped fund the research done at the Wuhan lab, uh, he described the virus is created by gain-of-function as killers. What kind of things do they do to these viruses to make them more dangerous? I mean, how does that actually happen? There's two kinds of things you do in gain of function. One is you take big pieces of the genetic code and you just mix them up. Um, these are events that are very, very rare in nature. So, um, you, you know, basically these folks have taken a, a bad virus that would never infect humans and they've, they've sewn in a human segment and then suddenly it can kill human cells. So that's one kind of deep gain of function. And the other is the thing that Mendel's been doing you know, for 200 years, which is serial passage. So if you have a, a virus that will only grow on bats, you start growing it on human cells. And the first time you grow it, it doesn't do very well, but you, you repeat that and by 10 or 11 passages, you have, you have really taught it how to infect humans uh, in a way that it would never see in nature. Uh, has there been research done in the past where they've, they've created 
uh, viruses like this, and and they've they've effectively been deeply concerned about just the storage and, and containment of it. I mean, how much of a factor is that when you're doing this kind of research? Is it really? Aren't they always running some risk of the possibility of leakage of viruses that are being made inherently more dangerous to human beings? Yeah, uh, I think that's absolutely true. And I, if I if you don't mind, I'd like to. Uh, be sure that your your viewers understand this concept of leakage is used, but really what it is, it's someone working in the laboratory who accidentally gets infected, doesn't know they're infected, walks out the front door and gets on the subway or in a taxi or an airplane, and that's how it spreads. So it's not really leaking out of the lab, it's someone walking out infected. H having said so, that- So someone uh, in the lab gets gets infected. Go ahead, go ahead, Doc. Precisely, precisely. So one set of publications shows that over 30 years, there's one lab acquired infection every year in Asia, one a year. Uh, there's another study that looked at two years in the US and there were 200 laboratory acquired infections. So uh, we don't hear about it very much, obviously, because it doesn't do what this pandemic did, but they're very, very common uh, because these viruses that are airborne um, are designed to, to travel in the air in small droplets and to be breathed in. Masks don't necessarily help in the laboratory if you have a high concentration of an aerosol. So it's a, it's a sitting duck for an accident. You've researched uh, SARS-CoV-2 extensively. What is it about this virus specifically that leads you to believe that it might have actually leaked from the Wuhan Institute of, Vi of Virology through this process that you just described? Well, it's, it's, it's a little bit of both processes. So the class of viruses, I, I shouldn't use the word class because that's an official term, but the, the SARS-CoV-2-like viruses that it's a family of, uh, in a thousand years of evolution, going back a thousand years, has never had uh, this furin cleavage site, which is a which is a uh, a, a piece of its uh, surface, which is recognized by a human scissors that cuts it, makes it very infective in in humans, very rapidly infective, and also allows it to infect the brain, uh, the blood vessels, the heart. So all of the the worst parts of SARS-CoV-2 are because of this furin cleavage site that has never been seen in nature in a thousand years in this in this group of viruses. Uh, the other is its is is its extreme adaption to to the human species. So, in 2003, the SARS-CoV SARS-CoV-1 virus, um, when it first jumped to humans, it it, it only had about 17 percent of the changes it needed to really cause an epidemic, and that took about a year and a half of practicing jumping into humans. SARS-CoV-2, in the first patient it infected, was 99.5 percent perfected in terms of human transmission. So it, it, it actually exhibits both of the classic uh, kinds of experiments you do uh, in gain-of-function research. What do you make of the uh, zoonotic origin hypothesis, this idea that SARS-CoV-2 jumped from an intermediary species from bats and then to humans? Uh, is it still possible? I mean, we heard about pangolins for a while and everybody was Googling what's a pangolin. And, you know, th this was early on the really the the standard belief, the consensus belief that people were being fed. Uh, did, ha, can, can you shoot that down effectively at this point? I mean, what's your what's your confidence level? <clears throat> Well, uh, in my Bayesian analysis, where I did a you know 140-page analysis that was shared with the State Department, the Vanity Fair article talked about that, so I can talk about it now. Um, the probability that this came from nature is 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 one in 500 at the end of that analysis. So, if you think about a, a, a zoonosis, as these are called, you have to have an animal that's infected with a virus that infects a human. So here we've looked for 80,000 specimens in 200 species over the course of a year, and we never found the virus in a market or in nature at all. Look back to MERS, which was a camel-acquired virus, or SARS-1, uh, a civet cat-acquired virus. 90% of the animals in the market had the virus. So it's not in the animals. Uh, in the previous in fact, in previous epidemics, the virus was very uh, uh, diverse when it jumped into humans because it was coming from many different animals. Here, this virus is exactly the same in the first human. Uh, and the WHO agrees with this and, and, and WIV agree. Everyone agrees with that. Uh, and the final element is that it, it wasn't practicing in humans like you typically see in a prior in prior infection. So about 4% of people in the environment, after you have an epidemic, you can look back in the refrigerator in the hospital and find specimens that are positive, about 4%. 
So the WHO tested 10,000 uh, specimens in Wuhan and found zero. So each of those independently is a one in a million probability. So if there's no animal, the virus is pure, and there's no practicing in humans. Um, so it has none of the hallmarks of a natural zoonosis. If in fact it turns out that uh, COVID-19 leaked from the lab in Wuhan, do you think that's gonna change some of the medical ethical considerations about gain of function research in general? You know, I think we, I think we do have to rethink uh, how we regulate gain of function research. And I have I have some ideas around that 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 I, I'll be sharing with with Congress next week when I speak to them on Tuesday. Um, but uh, I do I do think that um, if we don't if we don't implement some new guidelines, the next pandemic is in a lab somewhere in the world. Doc, really appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you. I know. From the very beginning of the pandemic, the Chinese Communist Party engaged in a campaign to obscure the origins of COVID-19, a campaign that persists to this day. So what are they hiding? Gordon Chang joins us next to help answer that question. Stay with us. The first cluster of novel coronavirus cases were officially reported in Wuhan, China, back in late December of 2019. But even before that, the Chinese Communist Party had already begun engaging in a campaign of lies and deception to mask the true nature of the virus. For several critical weeks, the CCP downplayed the severity of the virus, allowed it to spread beyond China's borders and wreak havoc around the globe. Then, of course, there was the question of the virus's origins. While the CCP initially claimed the virus began in a wet market in Wuhan, a story happily parroted by much of the scientific establishment in the media, we now know this explanation may have been little more than a cover story. So what was behind China's deception and how can they ultimately be held accountable? Gordon Chang is the author of The Great U.S.-China Tech War and one of America's foremost authorities in the People's Republic of China. He joins us now. Gordon, always good to see you. Great to see you, Buck. Thank you so much. All right, so the origin of COVID-19 may still be in question, but the fact that China lied repeatedly about COVID-19, that's established fact at this point. To what do you attribute the CCP's unwillingness to cooperate with the global community? I think there are a number of things. First of all, Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, wanted to level the playing field. I believe that he saw what the coronavirus did to his own country, and he wanted to cripple other countries. And so that's why in December 2019, January 2020, he took steps to deliberately spread this disease beyond China's borders. For at least five weeks, he lied about the contagiousness. He said it wasn't when the Chinese officials knew it was highly contagious. And then Xi Jinping pressured countries not to impose travel restrictions and quarantines on arrivals from China while he was locking down his own country. So by locking down China, he thought he was stopping the spread of the disease, which means that by forcing other countries to take Chinese passengers, he must have thought he was spreading the disease. So this was an instance, not only of murder, but by now mass murder, because we're talking about 3.8 million people outside China have been killed by this disease. For the purposes of discussion, let's put aside the scientific debate for right now. What, in your opinion, is the most significant piece of evidence against the Chinese Communist Party when it comes to the lab leak hypothesis? So just in, in terms of the CCP's actions, what's the primary thing you'd point you to say, we know they were lying to us? Well, for instance, on January 3 of last year, um, Robert Redfield, who was the CDC director at the time, actually called up his Chinese counterpart and asked about this. And uh, Gao Fu um, told uh, Redfield, no, no, don't worry, this is not contagious. So that was a clear indication that uh, China was covering something up. But we know that they inhibited the World Health Organization mission of this year, January and February. They prevented mission members from studying raw patient data. All of this is a real indication that Beijing did not want us to find out where this disease started. The idea that this kind of research was uh, part of a military operation has been dismissed, Gordon, as you know, in the past, 
even call the conspiracy theory, including by members of the U.S. government and different uh, ac academic and medical experts out there or speaking in the media. But there's a lot of crossover between military and civil institutions in China. Is it likely the Chinese military would have been involved in the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Well, first of all, we have testimony from a couple people that they were indeed involved. So Dr. Li Mingyan, the Hong Kong virologist who left last April, um, she says that at Wuhan and at other facilities across China, there were military officials there uh, and military researchers. Also, um, from reports that we hear of uh, Dong Jingwei, who may have defected to the United States, he may be in our custody. Um, apparently, he's saying that there are Chinese military researchers at these facilities. And indeed, we have what the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, says itself about biological weapons research. So all of this points in the direction that this was indeed a military operation. And by the way, Buck, China has this doctrine of civil military fusion. So for any technology that the military wants, they have immediate access to it, even if the institution or the researcher or whatever is nominally civilian. If in fact COVID-19 came from the laboratory in Wuhan, are there any significant steps the U.S. can take, Gordon, in order to try to hold the Chinese Communist Party accountable for this? Is that even feasible? Well, it's not only feasible, but it's necessary, Buck, because we know that the Chinese are working on pathogens that are going to leave the Chinese immune and sicken or kill everybody else. So we've got to deter China from spreading the next disease. And yes, there are things. We can cut our economic ties with China. And indeed, we have to do that, or we have to accept another disease, which next time could kill tens or hundreds of millions of Americans. So if we're talking about the survival of our country, Yes, we can take drastic steps, and we absolutely have to do it. Gordon, if we're just assessing how uh, China came out of this vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, uh, there's been a lot of analysis, and, and there's been uh, some assessments out there that, that indicate that China may have effectively been able to get out of this sooner and therefore find some economic advantage, at least you know, accidentally, as the, as the leak may have started, how do you assess that? Do you think that that's a, do you think that's a, a fair look at this? And, and has China, when all said and done, apart from all the lockdowns and the death and the misery, is there uh, is there a part of this where China actually economically benefited? Well, twenty twenty was uh, a great uh, year against for the China. competition. Right, twenty twenty was a great against year the competition for China. specifically. Yeah, um, because they showed some economic growth, probably not as much as they claimed. And of course, the rest of the world uh, showed downturns. But Buck, um, 2021 is a different story because the United States has effective and safe vaccines and China does not. And we know at this very moment that the southern portion of China is being hit by all sorts of uh, third, fourth waves in Guangzhou, in Shenzhen. Um, so China's not gotten past this. And I think they're going to have a hard time because they don't have the vaccines to make sure that society can open like it's opening in our country. Gordon Chang, everybody. Gordon, always appreciate your insights, sir. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Buck. The leaders of the Chinese Communist Party weren't the only ones attempting to silence proponents of the lab leak hypothesis. Evolutionary biologist Brett Weinstein will join us after the break to discuss the scientific community's efforts to steer the public away from the likely truth when we come back. If you've ever thought about investing in real estate, I want you to take me up on this recommendation right now. Visit doneforyoubuck.com where you can learn more about my friends at Done For You Real Estate. If you haven't checked them out yet, let me make this easy for you. These guys have found a way to make real estate investing straightforward and their system flat out works. I know because I'm using it successfully. It allows everyday hardworking Americans like you and me to finally own investment real estate without all the risk and difficulty of doing it on your own. I can't possibly tell you in strong enough terms during the 60 second commercial how important it is that you check these guys out. So how about this? If you visit doneforyoubuck.com, at the top of the page is a podcast interview I did with Done For You Real Estate, where you can hear my personal experience with their company in my own words. I'll tell you about it in detail, from picking the city to the house broker, the loan, even getting a tenant in place, so now I get free cash flow every month. 
Visit doneforyoubuck.com, listen to the podcast interview, and give my friends a chance to show you what they can do for you. That's doneforyoubuck.com. Welcome back. Although recently released emails from Dr. Anthony Fauci show that behind the scenes scientists were keenly aware the COVID-19 pandemic could have been caused by an accidental lab leak, publicly the scientific community rallied around a single explanation, that SARS-CoV-2 was the result of a natural zoonotic transmission. The mere suggestion that the outbreak may have originated at the Wuhan Institute of Virology was met with derision. Proponents of the hypothesis were called conspiracy theorists. In February of last year, a group of 27 leading scientists organized by longtime Wuhan lab collaborator Peter Daszak published a statement in the British medical journal, The Lancet. The statement read, in part, quote, we sign this statement in solidarity with all scientists and health professionals in China. We stand strongly together to condemn conspiracy theories, suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. Until recently, that statement stood as the final word on the subject, with few daring to propose an alternative. But a small handful of credible voices were willing to break with orthodoxy, including Brett Weinstein, an evolutionary biologist and the host of the Dark Horse podcast. He joins me now. Brett, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You were one of the early public voices saying that the lab leak hypothesis uh, should be seriously considered. What made you come out against the so-called scientific consensus on this? So many were just content to go with the flow. Well, there are really two kinds of scientific consensus. One consensus is the type that scientists arrive at after they've worked on a problem for a very long time. The other is one in which there's a rush to consensus in order to block other hypotheses from being investigated. And this was very clearly the latter. There was lots of evidence of several different types that pointed in the direction of the lab and away from a natural zoonotic jump. And it was incumbent on those of us who could see the evidence for what it was to make the point clear to the public. We expect, at least I do, lies from the media and certainly from politicians, I think everyone does, when it comes to that. But Brett, in this case, it appears the medical and scientific communities, at least in part, portions of them, really tried to steer the public away from the lab leak hypothesis really early on in what, what is still an ongoing now investigation, as we know. Why do you think that happened? Why they steer it? Well, I think different layer, layers of the system had different motives, but at the level of the scientists in the various relevant fields, I think there was a clear conflict of interest. What you had were scientists who, in some sense, may have been responsible for the culture that produced this likely lab leak. And they were facing a scenario in which if they blundered and it was discovered, that would change the entire landscape. Careers would be ruined, grant money would dry up. And so there is a natural and very simple explanation at that level. Why at the higher levels, government conspired to prevent this from being discussed in public, to stigmatize those of us who were willing to, to do our uh, work in public and, uh, and show how we got to the conclusions that we arrived at. You know, for us, there was no refuge. We were, we were dismissed as conspiracy theorists, which was obviously designed to stigmatize us and make people not listen. It was just recently announced that Peter Daszak, who was essentially the middleman between the Wuhan Institute of Virology and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, was removed as head of a UN-backed COVID origins probe. So why would the scientific community stand for a guy who's been so conflicted and, 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 and put him at the head of this investigation ever? It just seems to defy belief. 
It does defy belief. In fact, when I did my podcast with Yuri Dagan, Yuri Dagan is a an entrepreneur who did one of the early analyses of the genome of SARS-CoV-2. When I did my podcast with him in April of 2020, I referred to Peter Daszak as patient zero for misinformation. It was obvious back then that he was not a reliable source, that he had a severe conflict of interest, and why we are still paying attention to what he says about the origins of the virus is a mystery to me. Why do you think the dam ultimately broke on the lab leak hypothesis? Meaning, you know, what, what was it really? Was it the, the Fauci, some of the Fauci emails, that Wall Street Journal piece about some working at the Wuhan Institute of Virology who may have gotten sick back in December of 2019? I mean, what do you think? I know there's multiple factors, uh, but if you had to try to pinpoint what was it that changed uh, changed the situation so that we now know that not only is there no consensus, there's a, a really strong argument that the initial consensus was wrong. Yes, the initial consensus was obviously wrong, even if this did turn out to be from nature. All of the evidence that has accumulated so far points toward the lab and not towards nature. That could change with new evidence, but I wouldn't expect it to. As for what caused the change in the story, I would say there were several different factors, but they all pushed in one direction. You had the Drastic Group, which is a group of scientists, some of them anonymous, some of them named, who gathered on Twitter, of all places, and did their work out in the open. You had Joe Rogan's podcast and my podcast, in which these things were discussed in public. I also uh, said that I thought the likelihood of a laboratory leak was greater than 90% on Bill Maher's program. Josh Rogan did an excellent analysis uh, as did Jamie Metzl. And I think in the end, you had so many credible voices pointing to all of the evidence that there was simply no way to stall the obvious from coming to public attention. So there must have been an official decision somewhere that they were going to stop backing their initial story and they were going to do damage control by reverting to some other uh, narrative, which is indeed more true than the one we started with. But I don't have the sense that we're at the bottom of this story. You're of the opinion, from what I understand, that the deception perpetrated by the scientific and medical establishment goes beyond just the origins of the virus. Uh, you think that they're suppressing, actively suppressing uh, treatment alternatives, specifically the drug, uh, drug ivermectin. What can you tell us about this? Yes, I, I can't explain what I'm seeing. There is very strong evidence of multiple different types that ivermectin has a positive effect in the treatment of COVID. Maybe even more importantly, there is strong evidence that it is an effective prophylactic. That is to say that this drug, which has been used for 40 years for other purposes and is extremely safe, can be used to prevent people from contracting COVID without the risks that go along with these highly novel vaccines. Yet, in spite of the evidence that says that this is an effective molecule for treating COVID, and I believe that the evidence has become clear now that actually this molecule is sufficient for us to end the pandemic should we so wish. The fact that that evidence exists and we are not applying this drug, in fact, we are pretending it doesn't exist. We literally send people home who have been diagnosed with COVID to sicken in place and return to a hospital should their lips turn blue. We could give them this drug instead and yet we don't. I think this is absolutely inexplicable. Brett, really appreciate you bringing some insights to this conversation. Thank you so much for your analysis. Thanks for having me. While leading scientists dismissed the lab leak hypothesis and attempted to steer the public toward the natural origins theory, U.S. news outlets gleefully parroted the approved script. Outkick's Bobby Barak is going to join us next year to shine some light on the media's role in the lab leak cover-up. Stay with us. We're living in very uncertain times and being prepared for the unknown is more important than ever. I'm sure you've noticed the world we live in today is anything but predictable. The government is passing massive spending bills. The Federal Reserve is printing trillions of dollars in fiat currency. And many experts are predicting inflation could run rampant in the coming months. That could spell disaster for the dollars in your bank account. We can all benefit from something a little more reliable right about now. What could be more reliable than real gold and silver? I'm talking about real gold and silver that you can hold right in your hands. 
Call the Oxford Gold Group right now and learn how easy it is to get real gold and silver sent securely directly to your home or how you can have real gold and silver placed in your IRA or 401k. Just call the Oxford Gold Group at 833-600-GOLD and ask for your free guide on owning gold and silver. Again, call the Oxford Gold Group right now, 833-600-GOLD. The Oxford Gold Group is the only gold company I trust. Give them a call right now, 833-600-GOLD. One more time, that's 833-600-G-O-L-D. Check them out today. Once widely viewed as a racist conspiracy theory and fringe nonsense, the Wuhan lab leak theory is gaining more support from health officials around the world. And now mainstream media has all but admitted it dismissed the story because President Trump promoted it. Watch. And yes, I think a lot of people have egg on their face. This was an idea uh, that, that was first put forward by Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, Donald Trump. and. Look, some things may be true even if Donald Trump said them. Join me now to react, Outkick Media columnist and reporter Bobby Barack. Bobby, good to see you. Buck, how's it going, man? I'm all right, but it feels like the corporate mainstream media is never going to actually be held accountable for lying to the American people about something that was so important that shouldn't be political at all, which is just getting to the truth of the Wuhan coronavirus lab leak theory. Yeah, I mean, these same people have gotten so much wrong, but Buck, this one actually matters. So much of it is just nonsense, it's partisan politics. Like, in the end, it doesn't really change lives. During this entire virus, the media was so irresponsible. Instead of asking questions, which is fundamentally the only thing a journalist must do, that's 101. When you take your first journalism class, they say, ask questions your readers and viewers don't have access to. And they didn't do that at all. Buck, anybody with just a small ounce of knowledge could have put together, hey, this the, uh, lab in Wuhan, WIV, they study bat coronaviruses 400 miles from where we're being told this virus originated. But I don't believe in coincidences. Coincidences are an excuse for people in power not to have to answer questions. In order to not look into this lab a year ago, the media had to convince us that this was all just a big coincidence. And they didn't try to convince us because they couldn't. So what they do, they ignored it and focused on everything else, the mask, Fauci, Donald Trump. They didn't ask any question because they didn't want us to know anything about all this. How much do you think the media's anti-Trumpism figured into this? We know that Trump was an early supporter of the lab leak uh, thesis from, from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and he was one of many, many people, but the loudest voice, perhaps. So how did that factor into the media's treatment of this? I would say it's twofold because you're right, absolutely right that because Donald Trump was a proponent of this, they had to push back and say, well, don't give that too much credence because we don't want to validate anything Donald Trump's saying. But, Buck, I think even more, if they would have talked about this, asked questions, they would have distracted from their mission, which was to say Donald Trump is handling this virus worse than anybody in the, around the world, which was factually incorrect and in trying to make it where he's responsible for the reason all these shutdowns and people are dying in hospitals because they wanted to get him out of office, which I believe 100 percent is the reason why he's not president right now, the way the media portrayed him during this virus. If you would have swapped him place with Joe Biden, I believe these questions would have been asked because it would have distracted them from how poorly Biden would have handled the same virus one year ago. Bobby, it seems like we're just supposed to move past this, but do you believe that the MSMs, uh, mainstream media's just preposterously partisan and often wrong coverage of the Wuhan coronavirus leak, lab leak story, uh, does this add to some of the recent polling that shows Americans' trust in media is pretty much at an all-time low. Not only that, Buck, 
they already were walking on ice because of what they did for four years, particularly with the Russia stuff and how, and how they challenged the 2016 election, calling that invalid, and they refused to do that in 2020 at all, even to give it even a thought. But more so than anything, I always get asked, you know, what are the repercussions? The answer is zero because the people in charge, they don't want to address this stuff because that makes them look bad. They want to dust it on the rug because they don't want to deal with it. I mean, you think Jeff Zucker running CNN or the bosses at NBC, they're going to bring this up. They're a big part of why this stuff wasn't covered a year ago. So there is zero repercussions. So the next time a story like this emerges, and hopefully it's not nearly as substantial as a virus that changed the entire world, but I expect similar coverage because there's no accountability and there hasn't been in years, which is why we are in such a predicament with our mainstream media right now. It does seem, Bobby, like there's at least a bigger opening, perhaps, in a lot of people's minds for real investigative journalism and finding, I mean, this is one of the biggest stories. You could argue the last 12 months, the origins of COVID is in some ways the biggest story in the world. It's certainly up there. And friends of mine who work at places like the National Pulse have been breaking stories on the lab leak thesis, different aspects of it. So are, are, we, are we seeing some outlets, uh, upstart outlets that perhaps have a conservative bent, but some maybe are just new and trying to do real journalism, getting an opportunity here they might not have otherwise had because the big corporate media is clearly playing political games. Yeah, absolutely. But I tweeted something so similar to that a week ago. While there's no accountability for these quote-unquote journalists and hosts in the mainstream, what it does do is there's a direct result in why so many either conservative, independent, or alternative media outlets are rising. I mean, Ben Shapiro's success is a result of the media refusing to cover things from a different side. Joe Rogan became a hundred million dollar podcaster because he asked questions that the New York Times, the Washington Post, ABC, CBS wouldn't ask. And you, you bring up, you know, people the National Post. I'll let even look at like the Federalists. Um, they've done a great job breaking news on the Wuhan lab that was dismissed 12 months ago as a conspiracy which has now been proven to be actual hard-hitting journalism that matters. So the more this stuff happens, you have people saying, well, I'm not going to trust those guys. If they're not even going to have to address their mistakes, I'm going to go somewhere that's willing to ask the questions that I want answered. Bobby, we're going to see you do some investigative stuff coming up, my friend. You seem like you like to ask a lot of the right questions. Buck, you know, the big investigation now is I was told – How's this new radio show on over 400 stations doing? I mean, the Buck Sexton, Clay Travis, everybody wants to know. How is it? Well, you're the media critic, so what are you going <laughs> to give us, buddy? What's the grade? You know, Bobby works for Outkick, which is owned by Clay, just so everyone's clear. So I'm putting him in an impossible position, and we do need to have that, that disclosure here. We'll just say he told you, he said the boss, uh, A+, plus, A+, plus so far. Bobby, good to see you, man. Thanks so much for joining us. All right, Buck, nice to see you, man. All right, that's all the time we have for this special edition of Hold the Line. I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Stephen Quay, Gordon Chang, Brett Weinstein, and Bobby Barak for joining us, sharing their expertise, their thoughts on all this. Stay tuned for the No Spin News with Bill O'Reilly, Shields High.